All right, uh, so welcome everybody. I'm gonna be talking about the 10 most common Azure mistakes and how to fix them. Now, I have already posted these slides up on my blog. It's just my first and last name, scottsauber.com. Uh, and if you wanna follow me on Twitter, I'm Scott Sauber there as well. Uh, so, uh, hopefully you're in the right room, uh, but really I'm really targeting anybody who's using Azure. Now, if you're using AWS, some of these concepts will translate, uh, but really I'm targeting people who are using Azure, as you might expect. Now, this is like an hour-long talk, and I could probably actually spend like all day talking about this that I'm going to try and do in 15 minutes, so we are going to move pretty fast uh, throughout this talk. So normally this is really scheduled as a series of lightning talks. So I'm doing like a lightning talk, uh, like a meta lightning talk, where it's a series of lightning talks within a lightning talk. So we'll see how these goes. But we'll talk about all these different things here and kind of transition between all these different uh, topics. And I'll try and summarize my thoughts on those in like a minute or so uh, on each one of these. And hopefully you get a lot of value out of this because I'm trying to synthesize all this stuff into like the smallest uh, piece of value possible. So at the end of the day, hopefully uh, you get some ideas on how to make Azure more cost effective, more performant, and more maintainable. And when your boss asks you like, hey, what'd you learn at NDC Copenhagen? Hopefully you can pull out one or two things uh, from this talk. So who am I? I'm the Director of Engineering at Lean Techniques. We're a software consulting company based in the US, Microsoft MVP, Dome Train author, and yeah, do some other stuff too. But let's talk about like why this talk. And I put my image into ChatGPT and said, hey, give me an image of myself cleaning up an Azure data center, and this is what it came up with. So uh, I guess that's me. But uh, anyway, so a lot of what I've done over my consulting career is I go help these companies, and I notice like a lot of people's Azure environments kind of feel like they were thrown together. Somebody did a POC one time, and then that became production, and then over the years that became the production environment. They looked around and was like, oh my goodness, what happened here? And we actually have an offering that like comes in and does like an audit of your Azure environment. So like this talk is kind of like the summary of a lot of those audits and kind of the most common things uh, that I've seen. Like how many people feel really good about the state of their Azure right now? One person who's giving me kind of an ish type of answer. So it's a safe place, it's okay. Uh, but I'm going to talk about a lot of these different topics, and hopefully you can take back some of these to make your Azure more uh, maintainable. So the first thing we're going to talk about is account organization. So the problem is a lot of uh, Azure accounts I find are a big mess, like there might be one subscription to rule them all, or like some subscriptions are named this way or that way and just kind of not really organized super well. Resource groups don't really have any real structure. So the solution to this is you should really develop some sort of account organization strategy. So with subscriptions, this is kind of an it depends, but at minimum you should have a subscription per environment, but larger enterprises have subscriptions per team per environment. So you might have like team A, dev, team A, prod, all of those kinds of things. But resource groups should always be per app per environment. So all of your resources that go into like a certain application, like the database, the uh, web, web server, all that kind of stuff should always be in the same resource group per environment. And we didn't have enough ways to organize things, so Microsoft uh, earlier this May came up with this thing called service groups, which is kind of like a way, fancy way of doing tags and allows you to say, hey, here's all my production apps or here's all my GDPR apps or whatever the case is. So that is account organization. We're gonna be talking a lot about standards, and the next one we're gonna be talking about is naming standards. How many people feel good about how they name things? A few people, I wanna to talk to you later. All right, so what I found is a lot of people don't have consistent names across their Azure resources. So the solution to that, surprise, surprise, is to actually have a standard around this. How many people knew that Microsoft actually has a recommended way of naming things? Okay, maybe like, 20% of the room, maybe. So I've got some links here. Again, these are on my blog. Uh, these slides are on my blog, but they actually have a recommended naming convention. And what that looks like is you have like an abbreviation of the resource type. So in this case, I've got an app service running and their recommended abbreviation is APP. So app dash, and then the application names like navigator dash environment names, so in this case, dev, and then the instance number in this case, dash 001. And Azure actually has a naming tool you can run. Uh, does anybody know what the naming tool is named? Anybody, anybody? The Azure naming tool. <laughs> I actually think this is a great name, personally. Like, I love that I know exactly what that is. 
But really, I don't really care what you pick, to be honest with you. Just pick something, be consistent with it. That's the more important thing versus having different teams having, having different naming standards. And you can actually enforce this with Azure Policy, which we'll talk about here in a second. So the next thing we're going to talk about is tagging standards. So uh, tags are metadata about a resource, and a lot of companies I see don't have consistent tags, which makes it really hard to answer questions like, hey, how much does my production environment cost per month? Or how much does, does this application cost per month? Or who owns this resource? And so tags help solve that problem. So you should implement a tagging standard. So some common tags that you might have are things like the environment, who owns this, the business unit, all sorts of different things. But really, again, just pick whatever standard uh, makes sense for you. And you can also enforce this with something called Azure Policy, which we'll talk about right now. So we're going to talk about Azure Policies. Side note. Do people watch The Office? Handful? OK, this GIF is from The Office. I love The Office. Anyway, uh, I guess I should say the American version of The Office. I haven't seen the British version of The Office. All right, uh, so the problem is it's great. We've defined all these standards, like our naming standards, our tagging standards. But now we've got this document sitting over in Confluence or in a GitHub wiki somewhere, and nobody actually looks at it or knows what to do with it, right? So you don't follow these standards you've defined. So the solution to that is to use something called Azure Policies. So Azure Policies, you can enforce your naming standards, you can enforce your tagging standards, and you can have different effects. You can say like, hey, if somebody tries to create this resource, deny uh, this resource from being created, or you can say, hey, flag it as an audit so you can see which resources are not compliant. Or you can say, auto-modify it and fix it. Don't do this one because if you're using infrastructure as code, now your infrastructure infrastructure as code is going to be off from what your resources are, uh, so don't do that one. Um, but you can also make sure, use Azure policies to say like, hey, make sure we're enforcing HTTPS or you know, TLS 1.2 or whatever is enforced, um, things like that. So you can also use Azure policies in that sense as well. OK, let's next talk about managed identities. So the problem with outmanaged identities is you've got these credentials that you've got to like maintain yourself, rotate them, because we're all rotating uh, credentials, right? 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 It's a safe place? OK. Uh, and a lot of people are still using like Azure SQL uh, with like usernames and passwords and things like that. And I, see, I probably see like 95% of companies uh, still doing this. They might be accessing Key Vault with a client ID, client secret. And of course, somebody might commit a secret and things like that, or like, hey, somebody leaves the company, but they know what that secret is, all that kind of stuff. So the solution to this is to use something called managed identities, which allows you to assign a resource an identity, which is kind of like, hey, run this as a particular user. And then that identity is kind of completely managed by Azure. So there's no like username, password, client ID, client secret. None of that's managed uh, by you. It's all managed by Azure. And then you assign that managed identity to a resource, like an app service, an Azure function, that kind of stuff. And then you can tell uh, Azure, like, hey, this app service can talk to this database or can talk to this key vault or something like that. And so the nice part about this is now your connection string for your database is no longer has any credentials in it at all. It just has like the URL of how you connect to it. And so it's not a secret anymore. It's just a URL, essentially. So it's completely passwordless, and you don't have to uh, do anything uh, whatsoever as far as maintaining the credentials goes. And then in your code, you can use something called default Azure credential to do the right thing, which we'll talk about here right now. How many people know what default Azure credential is and are using it? OK, keep your hand up if you know the problems with default Azure credential. OK, about half the people who had their hand raised, cool. So the problem is a lot of people use default Azure credential without knowing the trade-offs. So default Azure credential is not meant to be a performant way to run your application. It's meant to get you into Azure as quickly uh, as possible. And the reason behind that is uh, they, there's a lot of different ways to authenticate to Azure, which we'll talk about here in a second. And the downside of using default Azure credential is performance. So by default, you might not be able to see that super well, but there's a lot of different ways you can authenticate to Azure. And under the hood, default Azure credential is trying all these different ways for you. So it's like, hey, am I trying the environment variables way first? Did that work? Nope. Move on to the next one. So if you need to authenticate and you're like way down the chain, you're going to end up eating, kind of depends, but you're going to end up eating like one to three seconds or so, maybe upwards of, I've seen as long as 10 seconds, 
uh, for it to actually connect to Azure, which if you're trying to do things like on each request and using default Azure credential, that's gonna be bad news for you, as well as like if you're running it on app boot and things like that, your app's gonna start up slower. So instead, you should be explicit about credentials. So for instance, locally, if your team uses like the Azure CLI credential in Visual Studio, um, you can say like, hey, use those, try those first. Otherwise, if I'm deployed out, use managed identity that we talked about earlier. Or you can use excludes on default Azure credential as well. So again, in my experience, depending on where you're at, this can save about two to 10 seconds. I wrote a blog about this three years ago, and Microsoft recently, last year or so, released a blog about default Azure credential best practices. So what that looks like is before in your old code, you would say, hey, just create me a new Azure, a default Azure credential. But uh, the new way is you can do this chain token credential, which kind of makes your a new chains. In this case, I just have the Azure CLI credential in Visual Studio, so it tries the Azure CLI first, then Visual Studio. But if I'm not local, use manage the manage identity credential because I'm uh, using that in a deploy, deployed out environment in Azure, and then plug that into Azure Key Vault. So that kind of gives you an idea of how to do uh, some of that. So if you're using default Azure credential today, you should probably stop and reevaluate how you're using it. Okay. So next one we're gonna talk about, which I alluded to a little bit earlier, is requiring TLS 1.2, so, or above. So HTTPS, which many of us know, has underlying encryption algorithms, and those continue to get better and better over the years in order to encrypt our data more securely. And um, not relying, requiring TLS 1.2 or above allows people to connect to your app using an insecure protocol, which means they can actually get access to the data that's kind of in transit in, in, transit in your application. And so this is obviously really bad, um, and depending on the data that's being kind of exposed on your website. So the solution to this is to require TLS 1.2 on all uh, effective resources, so things like app services, functions, storage accounts, those kinds of things. And then also make sure you have a good cipher suite. I'm not even gonna try to attempt to pronounce what, what any of those are, but use one of those. Um, but TLS 1.3 is actually the most, uh, the latest version, and most browsers that have been out for four to five years uh, support TLS 1.3. So you can also pick TLS 1.3 as a target, depending on your user base. There is also this site where you can plug in your URL and see, hey, do we support a good uh, version of TLS or not in the uh, Cypher suite? So if you go to that URL, it'll tell you, hey, do you, uh, are you good in this space? So also consider uh, requiring TLS 1.2 or above. All right, federated credentials. How many people are using federated credentials today for their CICD pipelines? Only a handful, maybe like six people. So the problem is your CI CD pipelines need to authenticate to Azure to provision resources, deploy your applications, all of that kind of stuff, right? And without federated credentials, you're probably using a client ID, client secret, which is kind of like a username and password to log into Azure. Well, that's great, but you have the same issues that we just talked about earlier, whereas if anybody gets access to this data, now they can log into Azure and do things in your environment, which is obviously not great. So, uh, and they can do whatever, like, you know, add resources, delete resources, change resources, or deploy new code, all of those kinds of things. So instead, you can use something called federated credentials, which allows you to trust repositories to deploy to Azure. So this is also passwordless, uh, under the hoods using short-lived tokens, and there's a link here to use this with GitHub Actions. But to kind of show you what this looks like is, uh, behind the scenes in the Azure portal, you'd say like, hey, I allow this organization, in this case it's just me, uh, this GitHub organization to uh, push to this, uh, uh, push to Azure and this specific repository. Um, so this is kind of like the federated credentials way, so you're not managing a client ID, client secret. It's completely passwordless to you. All right, budget and cost alerts. Has anybody had a runaway Azure bill that they, yeah, a handful of people nodding their head? Okay. How many people don't have to deal with any of that? I want your job, like not having to deal with paying for that or anything like that. Uh, so the problem is by default, cost is not managed in Azure. There's no button that says, hey, only spend this amount in Azure. So this can lead to sudden unexpected bills, no early warnings of, hey, we're projected to overrun our budget. You don't have visibility across your teams and then like anomalies or uh, fraud detection that comes up, you don't have that out of the box either. 
So the solution is to use Azure budgets. And this defines like a spending threshold of like, hey, I only want to spend $1,000 on this uh, subscription, let's say. And then you can say, I only want to spend $1,000 per month, per quarter, per year. And you can also have multiple alert thresholds saying, hey, alert me when I get 50%, 80%, 100%, whatever the case is. And then uh, you can trigger action groups when you hit those thresholds. So like commonly like sending emails, functions, webhooks, those kinds of things. Uh, sorry, you can't send a fax uh, uh, by default. Although you could put that like in an Azure function or something. But budgets are a really bad name because when I first heard of Azure budgets, I'm like, OK, if I, I will never exceed that budget that I set. But really, it doesn't actually stop your resources. It's literally just a monitoring tool, which kind of makes sense because let's say uh, your website's going crazy and you're in retail and you're scaling out and spending a lot more money, if they shut off all your resources, that's probably not a good thing for your business. So I kind of get why they don't do this, but just FYI, budgets, uh, it's not really like a hard budget. And it can also lag by 24 hours. There's also something called anomaly detection. So let's say you're still projected to be under budget, but let's say in the last 24 hours, you've like doubled your spend of what you did the prior, prior two weeks. That would be an anomaly. And so uh, something called Azure Cost Alerts help alert on those anomalies as well. So kind of use those two in conjunction. Okay, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about is about cost savings. So the first one is called Azure Reservations. And usually when you use Azure Reservations is when you want to reduce costs because cloud isn't always cheaper upfront. A lot of times people use cloud to like speed to market, lower total cost of ownership. Uh, more visibility on what's going on, those kinds of things. And so with Azure, Azure Reservations, uh, you say, hey, I'm committing to use like this tier of service for the next one to three years, and that can save you between 20 to 70%, depending on the resource, and I'll kind of show an example of that here in a second. But the downside is like, hey, what happens if you committed to three years, but now you don't want this resource after two years? Well, the good news is if it was like a 70% savings, your break-even point was you know, after a year or so. So even if you kill it after two years, you still save money in the long term. And you can still pay it monthly or all up front if you want, like if you need to spend a bunch of money uh, at the end of the year, but you don't have to pay it uh, up front, you can just pay it monthly. Now there's also something called Azure Savings Plans, which has, uh, is kind of solving a similar problem, but instead of saying, hey, I'm gonna use this tier of, let's say, an app service, I'm now gonna spend, let's say, $1,000 per month uh, for the next one to three years. You can still use, and then you can use it however you want uh, across those re eligible resource types. Now, not all resources uh, fall into Azure Savings Plans or Reservations, so just kind of look at uh, which ones do. So, at Reservations give you more savings, but you take on more risk in case you change your plans because you know, you're kind of locking in at a certain tier of resource. I recommend everyone use at least Savings Plans. So. How many people are not using reservations or savings plans today? Okay, a handful. How many people have no idea any of these questions that I'm asking because you don't manage your Azure at all? Handful, okay, sweet. sweet. Well, you can go to your boss and tell them like, hey, I think we can save at least 20% on Azure and hopefully you get a promotion or some sort of kickback on that. So give an example. Uh, so this was a P0 V3 app service plan. So normally it's 394 uh, kroner. Kroner, is that the right? All right, perfect. Uh, pretend I said that very confidently. Uh, kroner per month, and with a savings plan for a year, you save about 32%. With a reservation, you save about 41%. In three years, you can see it's about 50% with the savings plan and 59% with a reservation. So if you're not using this, definitely look into how you can save money using one of these two strategies. Okay, so some takeaways. Hopefully you got at least one idea today that you can take back to work and tell people like, hey, I learned this thing at NDC Copenhagen, so you can come back next year. And I intentionally left this slide deck pretty detailed because I always like, uh, I, wanna, I want you to be able to download the slide deck and get value out of it. So if you forgot what I said, just go to the, uh, my blog and I've got the slide deck there as well. So if you have any questions, uh, here's my contact info. We don't really have time to do this today. Or if you wanna book some free time with me, like 30 minutes, uh, I've got a QR code there as well. But yeah, otherwise than that, uh, thanks everybody.